What's up all you mentees, this is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, and join me today for an overview of the Excalibur Volume 1 Omnibus from Marvel Comics, so please stay tuned. And welcome back everybody, before I get started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the folks at Marvel for sending us a copy of this Omnibus. This Omnibus has already been released in the direct market, and comes out here in about a week or so in the book market. So we have two covers, this is the standard edition cover, and then on the left hand side here is the direct market cover. So let's pick it up, take a look at this spine here. Some of you all mentioned that you wanted me to hold it up a little bit longer like I do the trade paperback videos. But there you go, there's the spine, love seeing a volume one. And then the back here with all the content that is collected in there, all the little thumbnails of the covers that are found inside of this book. The book retails for $125. Here we go, holding it up from this angle as well so you can see that curve right here. Okay, let's look under the dust jacket. You have this nice image from Alan Davis, the sword is drawn. Now let's look inside and talk about what this collects and what Excalibur is. So let's get this opened. We have this reddish bookend pages. Wonder who that guy is holding an Excalibur sword. And here is the table of contents, what page you can find each of these issues. And of course the credits over here on the left hand side. Uh, somebody mentioned that they wanted to see where this book was printed and this is one of the Donnelly books printed in Asia. So we're gonna look at the binding here towards the end. And I'm also going to do a quick comparison towards the end here with uh, the Epic Collection and the original comic because this has a lot of meaning for me. This is my very first custom bound omnibus that I had made, oh my gosh, 13 years ago. Whenever I got huge into Omnis and I started looking at a Marvel series that would never ever get the omnibus treatment, I chose Excalibur. So I had all 125 plus the annuals and the specials of my comics uh, bound, custom bound. I think I even included the four issue miniseries Excalibur 2 or whatever it was called. Uh, never thought that we would see the day that we have an actual omnibus. And another quick little story before we move on to what this collects and when to read Excalibur. Uh, so, when I usually do the breaking news, David usually lets me know ahead of time, like, what the new Omnis are going to be for what month, and then the content. So, this particular Omnibus was originally solicited as a Chris Claremont, Alan Davis Omnibus. So, it was just focusing on the Chris Claremont stuff, and then the Alan Davis artwork. So, it was skipping a lot of issues. And I remember um, shooting him an email, and... I'm telling him I think it would work better in chronological order because I like to think we're in a time of collected editions where consumers like myself like to think that we're going to get everything in chronological order and it put a volume one on it we have high hopes that there will be a volume two if this book sells enough and you know here we are we have the Excalibur Volume 1, collecting issues 1 through 34 of the series, not skipping any, so it goes from the beginning of Chris Claremont's run all the way to the ending of Chris Claremont's run. It also collects the special edition, which is what you were looking at here, with the Glynis uh, Oliver cover uh, colors, and this is all drawn by Alan Davis, of course, but that's what kicks it off. That's why the colors are a little bit different, because this was a one-shot special that led into the ongoing series here. And then also the Mojo Mayhem number one, Quasar number 11, Thor 427 through 429. And then, of course, material from Marvel Comics Presents 31 through 38. 1136 pages is what this omnibus has. So it's a pretty big book. So one of my favorite things that they are doing here is at the end of each comic on the back where there's usually an ad, they had a pinup. They did the same thing with Wolverine comics, right? Uh, all the pinups were mo mostly drawn by Alan Davis, I want to say. But they're collected all in here. So, for example, you have a pinup here uh, for issue number one. So, this issue here ends. And in the very back where there's usually an ad, they put pinups. And I love that they're collected all in here. All the pinups. They didn't do this for every issue, of course. They stopped doing it after, like, the first year. I don't think they even made it a year. So... What the heck is Excalibur? So many people have messaged me asking me when I'm going to do this video. Um, Excalibur. How do I explain Excalibur? So, I have to talk a little bit about some spoilers to set up the events that happen here in the book. 
So, number one, there was already a character named Captain Britain, right? Famously uh, written by Alan Moore, drawn by Alan Davis. Chris Claremont uh, had a run on his book. There is an omnibus of that. Hopefully, one day it'll be uh, reprinted. But that's what introduces us to the mythos of Captain Britain and a lot of his characters like Merlin or Saturnine. So, there's a lot of mythos that comes into play from Captain Britain into this book. And then we have X-Men, right? You have Shadowcat, you have Nightcrawler, and you have Phoenix. So, during the Mutant Massacre, again, just a little bit of a spoiler here, Nightcrawler and Shadowcat were really wounded, right? Like, Nightcrawler was in a coma, and Shadowcat, Kitty Pride, couldn't uh, turn solid anymore. She was stuck in a state of being just faced the entire time. And then Phoenix had just, right after that Hellfire Club, fight with uh, Nimrod in about issue 208, 209. She disappeared right before the Mutant Massacre, and nobody saw her. Well, it, there's been some healing. There was a crossover with the Fantastic Four. Now, Shadowcat and Nightcrawler are on Muir Island healing, and that's where Moira McTaggart is. And then during this time, the X-Men had a big crossover during the Fall of the Mutants. And again, just a little spoiler, but the X-Men are believed dead. Right? All these characters, like Wolverine, Rogue, Storm... Colossus, they're all supposed to be dead. The world thinks they are dead. There's something else at play, of course, because it involves Roma, who was also part of the Captain Britain mythos. And now Kitty Pride is completely lost, right? Because Professor Xavier in issue 200 took off to space. He's gone. She may never see him again. All her friends are dead with the exception of Nightcrawler, and she thinks Phoenix is somewhere out there. Meanwhile, Captain Britain, his sister Psylocke, Betsy Braddock, is also believed to be dead, so he's mourning in his own way, uh, drinking, and he's with his uh, lady friend, Megan. So all five of these characters come together to form Excalibur, because they believe that the world needs these characters, these mutants, to fight off all these evils. And I love the fact that it's so nice to finally have it in a uh, chronological reading order that they included Excalibur 6 and 7, which is part of the Inferno saga, which... None of the X-Men even knew that these characters showed up in New York during Hell on Earth. But I love, 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 absolutely love this cover. It's a beautiful splash page. So here's the front cover, of course, and then in the back where they usually put a pinup or an ad, like most comics, is this wonderful just splash art of the events taking place in Inferno. So that's practically it, right? And then you're introduced to these wacky characters like the Red Queen and the Crazy Gang or Gatecrasher and Technet who sounds like they're going to work on your computer, but no, they're not. They're interdimensional beings. And speaking of interdimensional, there's a lot of alternate realities in these stories. As a matter of fact, Captain Britain is known to have started the 616 universe, right? Like that, that the first time somebody ever used the term 616 as we relate to our world here, the Marvel world, was supposed to have been used in an issue of Captain Britain. Here's the Mojo Mayhem storyline with the return of the X-Babies, of course, and beautiful artwork by Arthur Adams. Uh, Terry Austin does the inks, and then Bob Wysick does some of the inks later on. But let's keep going with this. So then we have this huge crossover. When I mean interdimensional and alternate realities, there is an awesome, long... Yes, let's talk about this one. Uh, the Cross Time Caper, which is about a year long's worth of storytelling in the issues of Excalibur. So, to me, this issue right here summarizes exactly what Excalibur is. It's X-Men without the drama. It's X-Men without the high stakes. It's just a damn fun book. That's what this is. There's a lot of heart because of Kitty Pride and Nightcrawler. There's a lot of ties to the X-Men. But to me... This issue right here just embellishes what everything that Excalibur is to me. And it's funny. It's quirky. It's a lot lighthearted. Not like X-Men, right? X-Men were dead. X-Men Siege Perilous. X-Men Outback Years was so full of drama. You read Excalibur and you're like, oh, whew, I could take a breath. That's nice. And that's what Excalibur is to me. Just lighthearted fun. And I can't spoil that. Um, and when I say the stakes are high, yes, of course, there are some high stakes like Galactus fighting Phoenix or Necron showing up. Uh, you have Phoenix having a flashback of her just horrible future that she's from, the days of future, past future. But when you have certain storylines in here called Girl's School from Heck, 
that's the kind of stuff to expect. This right here. So Alan Davis isn't the only artist. He has a lot of film artists like uh, Chris Wozniak. But this is the one that I remember standing out. Because first of all, nobody remembers Nth Man. I'm the only one I think that wants an omnibus of Nth Man. But we have Barry Winsor Smith inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. I don't... I can't think of another comic that both of them worked together like that. That uh, Barry Winsor Smith did the pencils, and then Bill Sienkiewicz did the inks. So correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they ever worked together other than that one-shot issue. We're introduced to the characters of Who. Of course, there's a lot of references to Doctor Who. This is the issue I need to come back to uh, because it's, what is it, Weird Happenings Organization, Alistair and Alistair Stewart, the Brigadiers. So there's a lot of things in here that are throwback to a lot of British television and then, of course, a lot of X-Men. So let's go back here. Here's the uh, stories with Eric Larson's Marvel Comics Presents. There is a really good cover here, though, by... Yes, I had two copies of this, and I tore this one out to hang on my wall for the longest time because this is Todd McFarlane, and I love Todd McFarlane, and he hardly got to draw any X-Men, so I took this one and hung it up on my wall because I was a big fan of Shadowcat. And that's pretty much it, right? So it's Captain Britain, this hero from England that fights crime with four mutants. You have Phoenix, you have Shadowcat, Nightcrawler, and Megan. And Megan is a shapeshifter. Like, she can change the way that she looks and appears, and she can also alter, like, her size uh, as well as her strength. She's a pretty unique character. You have the Ron Friends and Tom DeFalco Thor back here. Here's a little handbook to the Marvel Universe. There's Megan. Saturnine, Roma. Uh, Technet. Oh, I forgot. You also have the introduction of Widget and Kai Loon, who plays a bigger part later on. These are some behind the scenes back here. And then this is a Chris Wozniak interview. And oh my gosh. Had to take a pause there for a second. This is a Mark Silvestri inked by Terry Austin picture for the uh, Marvel swimsuit issue. Woo! Look at all that water. All right, here are the trading cards by Mark Bagley, Arthur Adams. And hopefully this is a good sign because this is the final issue. This is issue 125 that Alan Davis provided the cover for. Here's some homages to issue number one, the cover, and then some internal artwork in here. Now, let's talk about this binding. I'm not going to go through all of this, of course, but I did want to show off some of this extras. 1136 pages. That is a big eye. That's exactly what you want to see. And that's why when you're looking at pages three and four, you don't have any gutter loss. That's what makes a good binding on a book is that eye and the sewn binding. And that's when we're looking at splash pages. When I was flipping through here, you didn't see any gutter loss. And of course, when I'm trying to find one, I have a hard time finding one. But again, using this beautiful splash page. So you can get an idea of what little, no gutter loss there is right there. Now, there is something that I did notice that I also noticed in my uh, Epic Collections. And I'm going to use issue 30 for an example. So here's issue 30. And something that I noticed is I don't think this is going to do it justice, the video. But whenever they're doing these shades on some of these colors, there's this weird, almost, I don't want to say pixelation. Let me see if I can do it. a zoom in. Found in the colors. It's only when they're doing a shade, like something is shaded. Let me use another example here. So I think Captain Britain is a good example, like on his legs. And it's not often. It's not all the time. But... It, I don't know if it the resolution needed to be higher. I don't know if it was the type of color that they used on the paper that when it was scanned, this is what it looks like. But it's also found in the Epic Collection. So this is Epic Collection number two. And the colors, the way that it looks a little blurred, is also found here. Actually, it looks a little bit better in the Omnibus, like it's lightened up a little bit. Let me show you what it looks like originally. Again, my custom bound that I made myself. Well, 15... 14 years ago. So here is what the original comic book looks like. Let me zoom out. So the colors and shading look really smooth. There's no uh, pixelated or blurriness, if you will. Whereas if you look at the omnibus, there's a little bit of that. And it doesn't happen often. Really, it doesn't happen. The only reason I remember that it happened was because I had the Epic Collection. And I remember looking at that. 
And again, I stress, we're talking about just two issues and not every page. Somebody once told me in the comments section that it has to do with the scanner and the paper quality that they use for certain issues. That's what the outcome looks like. So I'm not really sure, but it rarely happens. But I did want to point that out for those that were asking that had the Epic collection, if they're using the same files, it looks like they are using the same files. But like I said, this looks a little bit lighter than it did in the Epic collection. So if you have any more questions, let me know in the comments down below. But that, as they say, is that. And if you want to purchase this book, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off the cover price. Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on packaging your books so they arrive safely and in excellent condition, as well as prompt and helpful service. Beginning Thanksgiving morning, visit their bargain bin for Black Friday deals up to 90% off cover price. New items will be added throughout the day and the rest of the holiday season. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discounts, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and the build of this book, as well as a quick little comparison. Again, this was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't don't forget to hit that like button subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet ring that bell for notifications to let you know when our videos are going live we can be found on redbubble and on patreon amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so and thank you so much to our existing patrons more importantly please everybody stay healthy stay safe out there and much love